Again, I want to welcome you back to the Client Conversations. If you joined us since the beginning, I'm Carol Wedge, CEO of Shepley Bullfinch, and your host for this series. So today, we continue to look at strategies for urban space and welcome our guests, Eliza Dada from E3 Development, Laura Martin from the Community Builders, and Tamara Roy from Stantec. Um, we'll, sorry, I'm on my wrong text. Um, Patricia's probably laughing at me. So um, here's some highlights for BSA programs. The most important thing is we're recording this today. So if you don't have, if you have children or pets or a background that you don't want recorded, um, please just either turn off your video or um, blur your background, but know that. And also there will be a link for continuing ed credits that will be posted in the chat. Um, so excited for the future of networking um, at the BSA as the BSA starts to think about coming back. Um, some exciting new programs that they're showcasing in these next couple of slides. Um, in partnership with the Housing Innovation Lab this Thursday, August 12th. And a matter of opinion on existing buildings, a series on climate action and um, building the will. <laughs> um, so that will be an exciting program and watch for a whole series of programs and clients that will be having those conversations with the BSA. Great, and encouraging people to submit for the design awards. Here are some submission deadlines that we want on your radar and make sure you're paying attention to. Great, so I'd love to introduce our presenters today um, who some of you may know or will be meeting for the first time. First, Eliza Data, who founded E3 Development in 2018. She wanted to pursue real estate development opportunities and related advisory roles with a focus on affordable and mixed income residential projects. Eliza is known as a creative developer with a successful track record of planning, financing, and executing a wide range of housing and community development projects. She has extensive experience and relationships with partners across public, private, and nonprofit sectors. And she previously directed real estate development activities for the community builders, where she oversaw a $1 billion pipeline of affordable and mixed income housing projects in the New England region. Prior to her work with TCB, she held a senior development position with the New Boston Fund, a private equity real estate firm, and Phipps House in New York City, the largest nonprofit housing developer. So you can see Eliza is not new to this topic. She's active in many organizations in real estate development, Urban Land Institute, Affordable and Workforce Housing Council, <clears throat> excuse me, Crew Boston, former member of the Boston Citizens Housing and Planning Association. She currently serves on the City of Newton Housing Partnership and Community Preservation Committee. She holds a master's in city planning and master's of science in real estate development from MIT and a BA in architecture from Yale. Eliza, welcome, glad you're here with us. Next is Laura Martin, who currently works in Boston as a senior development project manager with the Community Builders. So you can see there's a connection for Laura and Eliza there, <laughs> where most of her time is currently spent <clears throat> working on the Mildred Haley Redevelopment Project. I hope I said that correctly. Um, before working at TCB, um, Laura worked as a project manager on affordable housing development projects with two community development corporations in Boston, Madison Park Development Corporation in Roxbury and Just Start in Cambridge. Laura's introduction to affordable housing field came from her time at MIT, where she received a master's in sitting planning. And finally, Tamara Roy, who has been named one of Boston's top 50 power women in real estate. I love that title, Tamara. Um, and she was our 2016 president of the Boston Society of Architects. Tamara specializes in housing and mixed use master planning at Stantex. Her most well-known design is MassArt's Treehouse, student housing, and she's been the lead designer for over a dozen visible projects in downtown Boston. She's known as the mother of the micro unit. I think of Tamara as the person that's been talking about housing the longest, and she helped craft Boston's compact housing policy to reduce carbon footprints and bring more housing affordability wow. to the city. She's a tenure track faculty member in the architecture department at MassArt and the mother of two young adults. So we're excited to have the three of you today um, join us and share your stories. It could not be more timely. The conversation on housing and affordability is more urgent and visible than I've seen in a long time. Um, this is housing for all people and it's a shortage across the nation. So a recent story on NPR highlighted that we've underbuilt housing for a decade. 
with remote working as a new tool in our lives and as we navigate COVID, it also shifts the housing conversation. What kind of housing, what is affordable, what percentage of income should people spend on housing? So there's a lot to explore. So I wanna get started, excited to turn it over to tomorrow and it's just to hear from you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen here. I have a short presentation um, about these two projects that I've worked on with these two wonderful clients. Um, and then we will get on to the conversation. Second here. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. <laughs> So when I became president of the Boston Society of Architects, these were some of the things that we were hearing, which um, is you know, still the case um, and probably even more so, um, I think, and the voices have gotten louder and louder, um, but sort of, you know, the thing was sort of what to do. Um, and I've always been interested in innovation. So I crafted a, you know, sort of annual set of initiatives that um, we're trying to look at different aspects of the problem. So one of them was um, this really fun initiative we did where we built a 384 square foot modular um, micro unit called the UHU, which stands for Urban Housing Unit. Um, and we took it around Boston as part of the mayor's um, tour to try to get people interested and open to changing policies around um, housing sizes. And we actually, that's finally, it took a long time, resulted in the compact living policy, um, which is being used now by developers all across the city. And as a model um, for, I, I've had so many calls um, from um, sort of planning departments around the country about how, how we've done that. Um, the next was also an exhibit. We took over the BSA space and um, tried to illustrate um, in sort of real space, what a co-housing development might be like, um, because that was a new idea back then. It's now um, been taken up by, um, you know, all sorts of developers and um, startups around the country. Um, so that's an idea that, you know, kicked off here and sort of just made its way all around the country. Um, of course, none of these are new ideas. We, they've been taken from um, other, you know, cultures, other places around the world, um, but brought here. Um, to try to see if we could do some more innovation and experimentation. The next initiative was actually a developer competition um, because I didn't want to just leave these things as being theoretical. And so we, we picked a Boston um, city-owned site in Roxbury and did a competition with developers. And that, unfortunately, Dream Collaborative won. Um, and Greg Minot, who's our current president, um, who we love, um, his firm won that, um, but it hasn't been built. Um, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but that, that makes me a little sad. I'm sorry about that. Um, and then Renee Loth um, did an entire issue of Architecture Boston on housing. So, you know, we were really trying to just span, span all of the different possible um, ideas for innovating, not all of them, but some of them. Um, anyway, one of the things that we did was focus, as I mentioned, on the urban housing unit. And I have a short video that I would love to share. So I'm going to stop sharing this presentation for a second um, and move to the video. Should we find it here? Okay. Um, and please, I hope that the sound is working here. Um, let's try it. Is the sound working? Someone unmute and tell me yes. It's not. It's not? No. <laughs> okay. We did the sound check before. All right, well, I think, let me just stop sharing and I'll make sure to click that. Um, audio, yeah. Special audio button. Yep, we amazing, it just unclicked it, so there we go. Uh, okay, let's try to. The Yuhu is a prototype 185 square foot apartment built in partnership with the Mayor's Housing Innovation Lab, the Boston Society of Architects, and Live Light. Its purpose is to gather community feedback about compact living in Boston neighborhoods. The Yuhu design is based on years of research on small unit living. It has a space for every function a large entrance foyer, a bed alcove that can be hidden with curtains for more privacy 
a wide hallway flanked by a storage closet and a code compliant bathroom, and a living room with a full kitchen and dining area. And what makes the Yoohoo extra special is its many other features that make it seem so much bigger than it is. Let's take a tour. At the entry, the Yoohoo is designed so you can see right through to the large windows in the front. There are hooks for coats, shelves for extra storage, and a place for a bench or other furniture so you can personalize. The bedroom alcove is large enough for a queen-size bed with space to walk around it and a bedside table. Above is a large storage area for whatever you have that needs to be hidden from view. The wide hallway has lots of storage, an extra wide double door closet big enough for a stackable washer dryer and a clothing organizer, and storage above for items you use less often. The bathroom has a wide sink area and a large mirror cabinet with space for baskets or a storage cabinet below, a towel rack, and a walk-in shower. Easier for seniors, and it feels like a nice hotel. Back in the hall, there is a bookshelf for office supplies, cookbooks, pantry items, whatever you like. And then the main living area is the wow space. Two pull-out sofas make room for guests and provide plenty of seating. The dining table can easily transform from a desk to seating for up to six people for a dinner party. And with one entire wall of glass and doors that open to a balcony, the room feels large and bright. Most people are afraid that compact living means mini fridges and living like a student. Not here. The kitchen has a two burner stove. Who's used more than two burners? Lots of cabinets and shelving, a large sink, a full size refrigerator and a pantry, as well as a microwave convection oven. Now here's what some of you whose visitors had to say. How do I explain it? I don't know, it's small, but it's like spacious at the same time. Like it's tiny, but there's more than enough space. Like you usually don't find that very often. You know, I would love to see this happen, you know? And I've never seen anything like this. This is the first time, you know, something like this coming into Mattapan. So it would definitely be um, a great, great, you know, a great project to definitely see, um, you know, moving forward, you know? Um, the fact that I'm still a student and you know, a lot of people that I know are still living at home with their parents and stuff, and they're looking to get out on their own. This would be a great way to start out. Yeah. I could have company in. I could have, you know, people come in, but they're not going to stay over. It's just for me, you know? I love it. I love it. I love the idea, really. I love it. I love it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So, um, so back to this other presentation. All right. So um, that was part of the my presidency, and after that, it was um, you know interesting to see like what projects might grow out of it. And this one um, that Eliza is working on right now. Um, is one of those projects. And so I'm really proud to, to, um, to show it to you um, because one of the, the frustrations, I guess, about the, um, the small unit movement that I found was for me, it really came from a desire for affordability and yet developers, um, you know, that it was put in the seaport that when the seaport became an innovation district, um, the city actually made um, made certain percentage of units be innovation units, which was kind of code word for micro units. Um, but the developers ended up basically um, saying to me, well, the reason we're doing it is because we can charge more per square foot, right? So you were getting less space and you were paying more per square foot for rent, which was sort of the like reverse of what the goal was. Um, so in this case, this is really affordable housing um, with micro units as the fundamental basis for it um, and in a great site along New Bedford's main street, which is called Union Street. You can see it here. Um, the project is um, they've destroyed the this um, building on the right. Um, so now this is an empty site and there's a historic building called the Moby Dick building on the left. The project encompasses all of this site. 
Um, it's in a great location. It's the blue square here. So there's access to the waterfront, the historic district. It is part of the historic district of New Bedford, but also part of this really growing and transforming downtown area of New Bedford, which is very walkable. Um, it's part of a gateway city and an opportunity zone within a gateway city, which is perfect. That's why these policies are enacted is to try to um, help these types of sites. And it was purposely for, um, for adding some affordable housing and workforce housing. There's um, a lot of students nearby, teachers, firemen, um, others in the medical profession, so, you know, all of these folks need, need housing. There's, um, there's actually a ton of underutilized parking garages. So um, with space for only one parking um, space on the site, we needed to prove to the, to the city that um, it would be affordable for folks if they had cars to be able to park in those garages. And this is the plan, this is the typical plan. So you can see a lot of these studios, which are very much, this is the Yuhu model. Um, and then some smaller one bedroom, smaller twos. Um, and so, you know, you can see a really high percentage um, of, of units are studios. And that was because the, the clients, you know, really wanted to talk, um, to hit this gap in the market um, of, everything from seniors to the, even the disabled who are single um, to students and young professionals. And I'll, I'll let um, Eliza talk about that a little bit more. Um, and then on the ground floor, we had a vision of a lot of common space similar to a co-housing development. So the goal is shrink your living space, this personal and um, expand the living space that's shared. Um, but one of the things we needed to do along the way in order to make the project more viable was actually add some units in the ground floor as well. Um, so some of that lounge space has been taken up by a um, couple of ground floor, three ground, ground floor studios. Um, you know, the architects on this call will appreciate that working in a historic district um, can be a long and um, difficult permitting process. And one of the things that we needed to do was some analysis about what, how the design relates to the cadence of the buildings that are going along the side of Main Street. Um, and also the heights um, we wanted, we needed actually um, at least four floors on this site of density. And, um, but yet, you know, there's a lot of taller buildings in New Bedford, but they're not in the historic district. In the historic district, the, the buildings are two and three stories. So we were saying, since we're on the edge, we'd like to refer more to the taller buildings. That was a difficult sell for the historic district. And we did analysis about um, what the materials were in town as well. So we started out with this design, um, breaking the project into two pieces, um, and then a base that knits in with the bases along Main Street um, and some setbacks on the roof. Um, and we ended up with this one, um, which I always find, you know, in the process is um, not maybe where you thought you'd end up, but, um, but is also, you know, we work very hard for it to be still a nice design, but again, not like maybe, you know, you're hope as an architect for some sort of cool German modernist um, <laughs> building in the middle of downtown. Um, so, you know, focus on red brick, um, even this, you know, the taller piece that we had here has been shrunken and pushed back. A lot of these shaping moves were made even more, um, more shaped, which, you know, has budget implications, which are, you know, tough to deal with um, on the back end of this project. Um, but, you know, an incredible improvement and transformation to this site in New Bedford. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Eliza to just talk about the opportunities and challenges before we move on to um, talk to Laura. Great. Thanks, Tamara. Um, great overview. And I'll, I'll share just a little bit more about kind of how this project came together. Um, I'm a little bit newer to the project than, than Tamara and Stantec, but it, it all started with my partner in New Bedford, which is called the New Bedford Development Corporation. They're a local nonprofit and they're uh, an affiliate of the Housing Authority in New Bedford, which is a big, very well-run uh, organization. And 
they have a lot of housing resources, but what the um, what the director of the housing authority has found in recent years is that the market in New Bedford is so tight that he cannot place residents. He cannot. Um, he has a waiting list of more than four thousand people, and he just can't find housing. And so his his idea was to create um, this kind of offshoot, um, a, a independent nonprofit that would go out and build new housing that he could put people in because there isn't a lot of new housing production in um, in New Bedford. The housing stock is old. It's not very accessible for people who, who have mobility needs. Um, and so he is trying to expand um, expand the supply, uh, which is no easy feat. Uh, but anyway, so I, um, I am partner to this local nonprofit. I, I'm an affordable housing developer. I, I have my own company now. And, and part of uh, what my skill set is, is is kind of um, bringing together the resources that are needed to to um, create the vision here. So so the opportunities um, for this project, um, what we are trying to achieve here is is kind of create increasing supply and meeting a, a very well documented need uh, in New Bedford for more affordable housing. And frankly, for kind of smaller scale housing and more modern housing. Um, so I mentioned the 4,000 plus person wait list. Um, more than 40% of that uh, are people um, looking for one bedrooms or smaller. So it, it's a, a significant part of, of the need that, that we see in New Bedford. Um, and in addition to that, there's so there's the, you know, the folks seeking deeply affordable housing, but there's also this really cool um, artist community in New Bedford. There's students there. Um, there's um, there's a really nice energy in, in downtown New Bedford right now. And so I think there's the opportunity to to um, serve households at a, a wide range of incomes here. And so uh, but a key part of that is is the missing middle piece um, kind of. Um, more workforce housing and, and in New Bedford, because incomes are relatively low, that means you know people making between let's say 50 and $65,000, but there isn't a whole lot of that available. Um, so part of the thinking and developing uh, the plans for this project and the types of units that we've created here is with a focus on that missing middle. Um, so in terms of challenges, okay. So, so this project has taken quite a bit of time to, uh, to permit density uh, for sure was a need from both both because we're trying to create supply, but also uh, we're trying to, um, we needed the units to make the numbers work. Um, so I think it took some time to get, to get the numbers that we wanted to achieve in the building and, and the height here through the city, but we do have all the approvals and there is very strong local support because people want to see transformation uh, on this corner in the historic downtown. Um, the, the compact living units, so a big part of, of the program here are the more compact units. Um, that took some work, I know, for, for <laughs> Tamara and also for me kind of talking with, with the funders. So I, mean, I guess one um, kind of one observation is that, you know, from, from the client perspective, uh, a really important role for the architect on this project has been helping to kind of translate um, this idea of compact living and showing that with good design, uh, we can have smaller units that still, you know, will be perfectly wonderful uh, affordable housing units as well. And so part of what um, Tamara and her team has been helping me with is, is doing that translation for funders who may not be familiar with, with the smaller size. Um, you know, another challenge, and this is more on the financing side, is that, um, you know, market rents are really low in New Bedford. That's part of the reason why there hasn't been a lot of new housing production. This building will be the first new housing in downtown New Bedford in a couple of decades, probably. Um, so, so rents are low, the market's not producing, the project needs subsidy. And, and so I've been kind of helping um, pull in that subsidy to make the project happen, but, but, Gateway cities like New Bedford are sometimes a little bit um, reluctant to bring more deeply affordable housing into the mix. They want more market rate renters. And so we've had to very carefully 
um, kind of do a balance of more deeply affordable and workforce units here to keep the city support for the project. I, I find, um, as an aside, I find that that conversation is changing now, I think, in large part because of the pandemic and people understand the need for more deeply affordable housing, but that has been one of the challenges that for this project hitting the right income mix. Um, and the project needs a lot of subsidy. Construction costs are high. They're as, almost as high as you might see in Boston, and this is New Bedford. And so um, assembling all that subsidy is key. Um, and just on the last point, uh, Tamara made the point about parking. You know, this is a very kind of urban design. There's no on-site parking except for one, one space that we carved out. That actually, um, people in New Bedford got that more quickly than some of the state funders. Um, who just want to see parking with every affordable housing project that they fund. And so we've had to do some work to um, kind of help folks understand there is parking for those who need it, but this should really be kind of part of a um, walkable neighborhood and, and a population that may not have a high, high rate of car ownership. Thanks, Eliza. I mean, I, I always I call these projects a labor of love yeah. because you do it for the mission. Um, but I'm always amazed at how hard it is for the clients to actually get these projects to work. So um, I'm going to move on to um, the Mildred Haley project um, with Laura Martin and TCB. Um, and this is from our BPDA board presentation. Um, so this project, I also think, is just part of a larger vision of the Boston Housing Authority to introduce um, developers into their sites because they just have not gotten anywhere near the kind of funding that they've needed from the state and federal government to be able to even maintain these projects. And so they're just fallen to disrepair. Um, so they've asked developers in RFPs to come along and, and offer their thoughts really and how can you make this work and um, rehouse the people who are there but also they're open to upping the density. So um, Center Street Development Partners is um, taking over this area next to um, our project at 225 Center um, and the Jackson Square T. And this is, I saw Gail Sullivan on the call, this is Gail Sullivan Studio G's project across the street. Um, and, you know, just an amazing, amazing location. Um, this project, I, I love it. I don't want to call it like one of the challenges of this project, but since it's a client conversation, um, but certainly the three having three different client groups um, was was an interesting part of doing a project of this size. Um, all of them mission driven, and they all actually worked really well together. Um, with Laura Martin um, mostly taking the lead, um, and then of course, as these projects go, there's also a large consultant and design team. Um, you know, which makes sort of moving forward and every kind of roadblock that's put in front of you mean another big meeting to try to figure out who needs to do what to solve whatever is the current problem. Um, but the project is um, these six buildings um, of which um, there's, you know, all of them are income restricted. Um, there's parking, there's open space, community space, um, et cetera. And so the goal, the larger goal really in terms of urban design for us was to take what on the right um, is sort of a stigmatized neighborhood, I would say, um, which partly comes from a lot of um, debunked theories of the 1960s and 70s in terms of how public housing, where you can see, you know, all the buildings are the same. They're on a diagonal grid, which is completely different from the rest of the neighborhood. Um, you can only get in and out of this area in two spots and otherwise it's sort of a maze of parking lots. So all of the urban design um, sort of uh, principles are working against being able to knit this community into the rest of the neighborhood. And so that was our goal on the right and certainly the client's goals was to try and the BPDA's goals as well to try to do a different urban design plan where they these blocks look like they were part of the city and were knit with the rest of the fabric. Um, so we added a new road through, um, a connection there, that A road, we added open spaces, we connected um, Bickford Street as well so that you could come from the T and walk toward the stop and shop through the site so that again, it's not an isolated island, it's really got, it's really very permeable. Um, and working with Ground Inc. did some great open spaces as well. Um, 
a pedestrian path that goes through Parker Street and connects to Center Street. Um, so not all of this was vehicular. It would be pedestrian and bike friendly as well. Um, really, I think, really phenomenal master plan design. And then added this, um, this community um, program as well, the Anime Pool Center, which exists on the site and is a very vibrant part of the Mildred Haley um, program right now. Um, and needed to find a home in the new development as well. Um, phasing was incredibly challenging um, after, you know, as, as the BHA has um, proposed these different developments, they've learned that if they have to move people off site and then move them on, they lose way, you know, way too many people in that, um, that kind of life disruption. So the goal here was not to move anybody or at least move as few people as possible, which basically meant that we had to build on this part of the site that doesn't have any buildings, put phase one there, and then start moving people in different phases as the buildings filled in, which led to this uh, very complicated <laughs> unit mix, um, affordability um, matrix um, that you know, was sort of going in all these different phases as the buildings came online. Um, there were many, many meetings with the community to discuss this. Everyone actually who lives there, the residents were uh, on the whole, very positively excited about this project. They can't wait for it to happen. And I'm gonna hand this one over to Laura um, because there was a, a significant shift um, from the beginning of the project to the end where at the beginning market rate um, units were being brought in uh, to sort of subsidize the, um, the affordables, and in the end, they ended up with 100% affordable. So, Laura? Yeah, um, thanks, Tamara. That's a really great um, discussion of the Mildred Haley project from the design side. Um, and I'm, it's really been amazing to work on the project and to work with Stantec through the permitting process. Uh, we did face a lot of community comments and feedback during the permitting process um, about having market rate units or for a while we were going to have units restricted at 165 percent AMI so you know, this would essentially act like market rate units but not be the most deluxe of the deluxe in Boston um, and there was a lot of community feedback um, concern about gentrification in the neighborhood um, and so we Ultimately, you know, because of the community feedback and also the changing funding environment over the past year, it's been amazing. There's been a lot of increased resources for affordable housing from the federal um, and state level. And so that made it more financially feasible to have a um, project that had more of, a, was, you know, nearly all affordable um, or some level of moderate rate uh, units. So the income mix shifted uh, to being you know, a huge portion of deeply affordable units to replace all of the deeply affordable units that are there. And, and then, you know, new affordable units, but that are at a higher income restriction than the units that are there now, as well as some new moderate rate units, um, but removing that market tier. And this has played out, I will note, in different parts of Boston differently. Some of the other redevelopment projects um, do still have a significant market rate component in them that other developers are working on in the city. I think a lot of this does depend on the local community, um, you know, and their feedback and um, what makes sense for that specific site. Thanks, Laura. Um, and, yeah, just a very <laughs> detailed slide showing the income, um, you know, breakout by different units, um, you know, but I guess one thing I'll just highlight here is it's not every building has those moderate income units. There's affordable housing financing is a complex system in the United States and there's different funding programs that will fund different types of units. Um, so that's why not all of the buildings have, you know, the exact same income mix. Right. I know my mother is a math teacher. I don't know if you knew that, but even these matrix matrices would make my head explode when we tried to figure out exactly what the mix was going to be in each of the phases as they came online with each of the development partners taking, um, you know, different buildings along the line. So amazing. We did so many of those matrices. <laughs> and then um, PCA um, is the architect of phase one. And this is um, the two buildings that they're doing phase one and phase uh, 1A and 1B 
um, and the Anime Cole Center. And that has gone through the BCDC and the BBDA approval process. So you wanna take this slide, Laura? Certainly, yeah. I mean, absolutely a huge, you know, opportunity here is improving the public housing units that are at the site. Um, you know, I think something that COVID and the pandemic has helped, you know, the greater public be more aware of um, is, you know, the, the value of healthy and stable housing. And these are units that were built 50 plus years ago. They're really in poor um, physical condition. The site layout means that it's you know, not a very safe site to walk through. There's a lot of dark nooks and crannies. Um, so, you know, really improving those deeply affordable units for the city of Boston so that these are going to be healthy homes, um, you know, modern homes. They'll have AC in them. They'll have controlled heat. They won't have leaks. They won't have rats. Um, elevators. Does they won't have elevators, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you know, that there'll be, um, you know, it's a safer neighborhood design with kind of consolidated open spaces that are, you know, well lit and a lot of eyes on the street on those instead of, you know, kind of these nooks and crannies. Um, but, you know, certainly there's been a lot of challenges through the process, um, you know, particularly a permitting process that does take, you know, nearly a year to go through. So I think as far as, you know, designers just to be fully aware of when you're signing on to these projects, that is part of the process. It takes, yeah. Uh, yeah. Three years. <laughs> Three years, yeah, from the beginning conversations. One year was the formal process. That's not even the pre-process before the city lets you start the formal process. Um, it takes a lot of flexibility from the team and the team just has to work because you get different comments from different people and you know to adjust to that um, so it's you know it's great when these projects happen but they take a lot of grit to get through it um, and you know certainly part of that's considering all of the comments from the community and uh, you know Eliza underscored this as well but construction costs do just continue to be a reality of something that uh, the industry has to be really conscious of um, you know tomorrow's highlighting how do you design something so it's absolutely most efficient. Um, you know, that is just so key for how architects can contribute to affordable housing is that uh, to use every square foot um, and square inch to make it really part of a livable space is so important. Great, well, thank you all three of you. Those are inspiring projects. I'm sure there's a lot of questions that are gonna come in. Um, I was just interested in Laura when you said there are <clears throat> more, especially during the pandemic, more funding sources. I feel like, you know, sort of the, there's so many different aspects to this, but it often comes back to funding. Can you talk just a little bit more about what you see shifting and changing in this, you know, in this unusual time that we've been through? Yeah, certainly. Um, so one thing that's you know interesting is affordable housing is largely funded through tax credits in the United States, the low income housing tax credit program, and that's a um, you know federal um, legislation um, under IRS and snuck right into the COVID bill was um, you know a change in that program that increased the amount of funding uh, that tax credits allow. Um, so that's really been a substantial change that happened for the industry at the beginning of this year. Um, and so that's, you know, part of the financing piece, our uh, organizations will work in addition, you know, increased availability uh, for state uh, tax credits in the state of Massachusetts. Um, so there's been increased funding that the state's been able to, um, you know, consider how do we get this out there um, to build more affordable housing in the state. That's great. A couple questions that came from my breakout, and you guys might have some questions that bubbled up in your breakout as well. Can you talk a little bit about putting these projects in context around resiliency planning and sustainability and well, and just sort of the, the philosophy you're bringing to those as developers? Um, and then also, you know, what are the things that the BSA members can do to help tell those stories or help be a resource for ideas about that? So. Um, Eliza or Laura or Tamara, if you wanted to start with like a thought about how you bring those critical issues into your thinking. So I, I can say a little bit about kind of sustainability from the operational side. So uh, most, most of us affordable housing developers were long-term owners and operators. And so we do think about the very long-term and mm -hmm. operational costs are a big part of that. So I, I think even before, um, you know, the, the focus on sustainability, 
came into play, we were thinking about how to minimize those costs because it helps preserve affordability in our, in our projects for long term. And now uh, the agencies that we work with um, are, are helping drive that point home even more. They are either requiring a certain level of sustainability as, as part of projects that they fund or they're incentivizing that. And so um, I, I'm certainly doing more of that in my work. And, and I imagine uh, that TCB, I mean, TCB has always been focused on this, but I am sure it's become an even bigger part of your design focus, Laura. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, everything now is trying to get towards a passive house model. Um, and a lot of this is helping to explain when we, to financing agencies, you know, we can't actually, it's cost too much to do every piece of passive house, um, you know, but how do you explain overall the approach that's being taken to the building and high efficiency buildings? And, you know, I think a huge thing designers can do is uh, everyone gets buzzwords in their mind, right? So it's like, <laughs> we're going all electric, we're going uh, <laughs> zero, you know, zero carbon emissions and help break that down because, right, it's very hard in a lot of these buildings with tight budgets to make everything happen. Um, but to explain what can you do within the budget and what is really efficient for the building. And you know, I find that the design team is so important in helping to explain that uh, to people who just tag onto these buzzwords that don't always um, you know, mean the best thing for, for the building. Um, yeah, and, and to make really that, bad. make yeah. it real. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I think just, you know, similarly, um, people who don't work in housing, the workforce missing middle descriptors I feel like I would love to see them just made a little more human because I feel like there are a lot of architects and engineers and developers that work and live in the metro Boston area, you know, like we are the workforce housing, you know, it's not um, the this sort of unknown group of people or, you know, a certain income level, it's students coming right out of school and starting careers and, um, you know, people trying that would love to stay in the city, but the affordability has become quite complex and difficult. Um, Tamara, I wanted to sort of riff off of the, the sort of idea of um, the Yuhu and sort of as you're thinking about this, there's a couple different questions in the chat about how has COVID shifted our thinking, you know, sort of a sense that remote or working from home or working from lots of locations is here to stay, exactly what the future looks like we'll all live through and, and kind of design and experience. But do you see a shift in the conversation around housing? as COVID has rolled through, or do you have hopes that we could think differently about housing going forward? Um, a little bit, yeah, I do. Um, I think there's there's a retraction um, in, you know, full, full on love of the micro unit, <laughs> um, you know, which as my baby, I, I take personally. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, people need a roof over their heads and we're trying to do in as little space as possible, um, give them as much space as they can um, to, to work and live. Um, I have seen from a lot of our housing projects the increased interest um, in renting a unit with a balcony um, because people just want the outdoor space um, that's private um, to their unit. So, I mean, that's something that, um, that actually exists in the um, 117 Union project on the top upper floors. There's some units with balconies. Um, but I guess I'm just hopeful that, you know, that we'll go back to, to normal and we'll be able to use all those other spaces that our city has to offer that we call third spaces, right? Where you can get out of, you're not staying at home anymore and you can get out and use all those other things. Um, Cause it's also hit co-housing pretty hard too. Um, you know, if you walk through a co-housing project today, there's not a lot of people in the common spaces. Um, and that's, that's actually true of all of our luxury rental apartments as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, my son lives in Clippership in East Boston, and he has, he was asking them for a, a reduction in his rent because he wasn't using any of the common spaces. And that's why they rented there. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. There's definitely the trickle down of, of that issue. Right. And it will take also take time. Um, for us to understand the implications and also understand the value of some of those shared urban spaces. Um, so, you know, I think both of your projects really frame how does this contribute <clears throat> to that context that it's in, but also maybe aspire to help the context think differently about open space and sort of the urban design aspects that you bring to it. Um, there's a couple questions about, you know, sort of how to think about the mix. Um, 
And there's a little bit, I think the question is more about sort of worrying about gentrification, but also knowing gentrification be helpful and, you know, sort of how do you knit these pieces together? Um, and again, navigate that you want to provide housing for the people that need it, but also know that you're making an improvement to an area. And so can you talk a little bit about that, Eliza or Laura or Tamara, you know, how you think about that or so, sort of how some part of it is innate to improvements and adding, um, but, you know, sort of the mix of the affordability brings the community with you, but I'm sure you navigate that all the time in every matricy you're trying to do um, to understand how does it actually work as a development. I'll pick it up from the um, you know public housing redevelopment side, and I think Eliza will be able to speak really well about a new construction site and how that differs for you know a redevelopment site. We really hope that you know we're not only bringing in housing, we're bringing in um, community amenities, we're bringing in resident services. Uh, you know, so we want to continue to encourage people to grow in different ways in their life, and that means some people's incomes might go down um, over there. Lifetime, sometimes, you know, household income is going to go up and we want them to be able to continue to stay and live in that community. Uh, so I think that's something we really try and highlight and we look at that we're not building barbell communities where it's just, you know, really low income housing and really high, uh, you know, income housing, but there's a good mix in the middle um, so that people, you know, can continue to stay in the community as their um, household income goes up and down. And a lot of that is also then providing those amenity spaces in the design, those um, service spaces, and then those things within the program. Yeah, and, and so I'll just add, you know, the, the answer to that question varies depending on what market you're in. So in Boston, right. for example, where, you know, the, the shortage of affordable housing is being felt so keenly right now, I think a lot of the conversations like the ones Laura and Tamara are having are about more deeply affordable. In the gateway cities where the market hasn't really taken off yet, uh, like in New Bedford, um, it's a slightly different conversation. And um, there is often a push to do kind of um, more of that kind of market or middle income tier than compared to the deeply affordable piece. And so part of the balance that we've been trying to strike in New Bedford is what's the right balance there? because. Um, because the rents aren't so strong in New Bedford, so that workforce piece doesn't um, quite support itself and, and the more deeply affordable side does. So we're, um, we're trying to hit the right balance that still keeps the city happy in terms of their goals, but also makes the financing work. And so just to give an example of how that's evolved, um, initially um, when I came onto the project, the, the mayor was saying it's gotta be 50-50, no more than 50% deeply affordable. Um, but those numbers didn't quite work. So we managed to move that, um, move the needle on that a little bit. And now it's about 70% deeply affordable, 30% workforce. That balances, um, and we've gotten the city comfortable with that as well. But those are the kind, kinds of conversations that we have in, in weaker markets. That's great, that's great, really helpful. Um, I'm struck by how each of you have kind of indicated, I think Mark, <clears throat> Tamara called it a labor of love, hmm. or just, you know, this incredibly long-term commitment and passion you have for seeing the difference these projects can make. Can each of you just talk a little bit about your path and, you know, sort of how you ended in, not ended, how you are in this space today? <clears throat> and what are some of the things that kind of guided you in developing your philosophy and approach to why this work is so important? Um, so I was going to go maybe Tamara, Eliza, Laura, and give Eliza and Laura a chance to think about it. But Tamara, when you talk about it as a labor of love, can you put that in context? Like, you know, sort of, you've been working on these topics for a long time and looking for that innovation. Um, can you just talk a little bit about your story and that arc? Sure, yeah. I mean, I grew up in, um, as part of the lower middle class. And so actually, um, I, I, I experienced sort of not having great housing um, from the time I was a kid. And so, um, you know, even though I, I look like I'm a well-educated person who, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, so actually experiencing that firsthand made a huge difference to my career trajectory and being able to empathize with people who don't, you know, have even the gifts that I was given, um, you know, in terms of my brain and my heart, um, you know, and how do you make it through this life? If you if you don't have all those those things, um, and so you know, and you're not white, and all these things that you know, I could go on and on about. Um, and so I think that you know, housing for me 
um, I realized it was a space that was ripe for innovation. And it was like, and I'm still hopeful for it. I, I'm honestly, like at this point in my career, a little frustrated um, <laughs> that, that, you know, the, that there is this barbell um, in terms of design of, you know, luxury apartments with a tiny little fraction of affordability and then almost all affordable projects. And I feel like there's just this huge gap in the middle. And I had really hoped um, that, you know, there would be some development. Um, my, my breakout room, room the fellow um, Wolfgang was talking about, you know, fantastic projects in Germany, right? That are, you know, from, there's so many great examples out there but because of our financial structures and our development you know, situation, um, we, it's just very difficult to find those developers that are going to be able to make it and, and be mission driven and yet still you know, make a profit and have investors um, you know, in the sort of capitalistic system that we're in um, to actually meet the need. And I don't see the need being met. Like these folks here are trying their best Right, but as Eliza said, there's a waiting list of four thousand units, and we're providing, but you know, less than fifty. <laughs> yeah, right. In four years, which are incredibly right? important for fifty people right. or families, but and it's taking four years. So surface. yeah, we're we're missing the the forest for the trees here. Um, yeah, that's a great segue to Eliza. Do you want to just share a little bit about your path and passion? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, so I, I, um, I kind of started off uh, thinking I wanted to be an architect, but quickly um, realized that my design skills were not so hot. And so I um, pivoted into development uh, early in my career and into kind of affordable housing and community development. And, and it's been a great fit for me because I care about neighborhoods, I care about cities, I think housing is an essential right, and it's been really fulfilling for me to, to do that um, with my career. I, you know, in terms, I just want to talk about the innovation piece and my path there. Um, it actually traces back to a project that I worked on with some of Tamara's uh, colleagues, colleagues at Stantec. It was a mixed income building uh, in Chinatown in Boston. It's known as One Greenway or, or Parcel 24. And that was the first kind of really large scale mixed income deal I had done. Um, and it was so fascinating for me to understand that um, as we were designing it, that um, the, uh, on the whole, the affordable units were much larger than the market rate units. And, and they were therefore more costly. Part of that was because more of a skew towards family units. So there were some reasons there, but that, that imbalance was really um, interesting to me and, and kind of pose the question that I've been working on since in, in similar ways to tomorrow is like, well, how can we bring the cost down? How can we build more efficiently? I think a big part of that is design, showing that we can design good units in smaller space and really making good use of every kind of dollar that we're investing in the supportable housing. Um, it's been slow to bring our partners along on this path. I think we have made, some, you know, we're starting to make inroads, all the agencies that fund us are open to smaller units now. They used to have very rigid unit size requirements. And I think some of the work that, that uh, Tamara and others have done around compact living have helped shift the conversation, but there's still more work to do. Um, we're making good inroads on the sustainability side as well, but we all have to keep pushing this to make sure that we're building efficiently. That's great. Thank you, Eliza. And Laura, do you wanna share a little bit about your path and passion? Certainly, yeah. Um, I became really excited about development and affordable housing while I was in graduate school studying urban planning and realizing that you can be a developer um, in the United States and elsewhere and work from a mission-driven side and really make a huge impact and that, you know, particularly in the United States, it is often the developer who is changing spaces. Um, and so that was just a really exciting, um, you know, realization. And I think I found that to be very true and it is a labor of love and it takes years, but you know, eventually five, 10 years down the line, a project is built and developed. You can uh, you know, hear about people who go and hang out at that community center now and how transformative it's been for them. And so that's just, that is a really exciting space to be in. And I need to remind myself of it on a day-to-day -day basis when it feels like a project's never gonna happen, but they <laughs> often ultimately do. And um, Right. So when you're in that sort of process of the public process, you have to go visit the units you've done to see the vibrant lifestyles people are living to motivate you and inspire you. Mm -hmm. um, there's a really interesting question in here, and we don't have much time left, but I do want to ask, it came up in one of the breakouts was, 
um, housing, why, how housing is so key to building familial wealth or building wealth and stability. The real estate market has been an investment market. In many ways, it created the middle class from the GI Bill. I'm sure all of you have dipped into the book Color of Law and all of the kind of ridiculous racist policies that dismantled the neighborhoods you're trying neighborhoods that look like the ones you're trying to create of these incredible range of incomes and lifestyles and the arc of life. But can you talk a little bit are, are sort of there new conversations around the innovation of ownership and how ownership creates wealth and new diagrams of rent, you know, rent to own or or something along those lines. I I don't really know what I'm talking about. I'm more asking you guys to share um, some perspective for this question. Yeah, so I, I can I can start that one because it's it's something that I'm finding myself getting more involved in. Um, so I, because I have my own company, I have the flexibility to um, kind of try different projects and um, get involved in different things. And I used to I used to do only pretty much only rental housing, but I'm involved in quite a few home ownership initiatives now. Um, I I think there is a huge interest in in creating um, home ownership opportunities. Uh, both because of the kind of wealth creation question. There's also a question of neighborhood preservation. So I've been doing work with a number of land trusts in the Boston area who are looking to buy up kind of older buildings and, and create home ownership, affordable home ownership opportunities um, within those older neighborhoods. Um, so I'm doing this work in Chinatown. I did some of that work in Somerville. Um, and there, the the tools are a little bit different and, and don't um, always exist, the financing tools to create that affordability, but we're working on adapting um, the available housing subsidies to make home ownership work, affordable home ownership work, particularly in communities of color. And part of the strategy that I'm working on at least is, is trying to find um, ways to do that at smaller scale uh, so that we can create more units and create more affordability at that entry point. Um, and I'll just let, say one final thing. There is there is interest at the state level in promoting this idea as well. The governor has recommended so that a, I think it's a, a billion dollars of the recovery funds, a big portion of that go to supporting affordable home ownership. So I think there will be, um, for those who can figure out the sites and, and, and the ways to make that work, I think there will be funding support for that concept. And I think also important reminder of how powerful BSA members' voices are in the community. So, you know, sort of thinking about, well, certainly in my breakout group, <clears throat> things bubbled up about how do we create some advisory boards or advisory dialogues to help people that are struggling with the innovation part um, and feeling like maybe the sort of regulations aren't, aren't as creative or forward looking. Um, so I think we're heading into a really interesting time. And there's also a lot of partners that are interested in how do we create this vibrant city that is, you know, sort of economically diverse, racially diverse, culturally diverse, and supports all different kinds of people and all different kinds of income. So, you know, I really encourage the membership of the BSA to get involved um, and learn more. I think sometimes, you know, I worry that architecture feels a little bit too privileged um, in how, you know, what kind of resources you have to have to even begin to think about hiring an architect and how do we think about our role more progressively and how the BSA can be a big voice for that. So I'm excited to see that in the future, excited to see the projects that the three of you will do going forward. We know you'll keep innovating and um, we just wanna thank you for your time and thank everyone for joining us. Um, so a big virtual round of applause for A, doing fabulous work and getting these things done, but also sharing your stories with us today. We really appreciate that. Thanks, you guys. So just a few little cleanup things. There are a couple of different programs that the BSA wants to continue to highlight. We hope you'll join us in September. We're going to cap our client conversation series with a conversation with Luciana Birdie from Massport and her colleagues focused on resiliency and the future. So join us for that exciting conversation. Um, and as the BSA transitions to hybrid events, in the fall and the winter, we hope to see each other in person and continue to engage in these important conversations about our city and communities and our profession and what, what we can really do to, to contribute to the innovation and design in the world that we really wanna inhabit. So again, thank you, Laura, Eliza, tomorrow, really appreciate it and have a great day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it was great to see you, wonderful stories. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to SMPS, our partner.